Today on Public Eye News, one person sighted and two injured after a three-vehicle crash in Marquette and a logging truck spills a load on a ro roadway. Later, Adam Diaz has an up-to-date weather forecast, and Caleb will be, ba will be back with sports. I'm Callie Hunter. And I'm Caleb Rydell. Welcome to Public Eye News. On Wednesday, a crash involving three cars occurred at the intersection of Washington Street and McClellan in Marquette. The Marquette police responded to the crash that occurred after 45-year-old Carrie Reynolds failed to stop at the red light. The two other vehicles were in the left turn lane and attempting to turn when Reynolds hit 42-year-old Jennifer Dieter, who was hit, who then hit the car behind her after a collision with Reynolds. Dieter and Reynolds were taken to the UP Health Systems and reported minor injuries. The third driver was not injured. Reynolds was found to be at fault for, the, for failing to stop at the red light, and all vehicles had to be towed away from the scene. Another crash happened yesterday around 2.15 in the afternoon between a logging truck and a pickup truck on US-41 yesterday around Broomer Road. The Michigan State Police responded to the crash. The logging truck was attempting to pass the pickup truck as it was preparing to turn onto a private drive. The logging truck tried to avoid the pickup truck by moving over to the shoulder, but it caused the trailer to overturn and the logs fell off the trailer. The driver of the logging truck was cited for spilling his load and there were no injuries. And Vista Theater in Nagani has been awarded $10,000 in renovations. The 92-year-old theater has been home to many productions over the years, but theater experts say it's time for an upgrade. The Peninsula Arts Appreciation Council, who runs the theater, was awarded $3,000 from the Greater Ishpeming Nagani Chamber of Commerce, while the city of Nagani donated $7,000 towards the renovations. And a Jack Russell Terrier mix that was brought to the Delta County Shelter in August after being found abused is making an excellent recovery. The dog, named Little Chevy, came to the shelter with multiple injuries such as a fractured skull, a broken jaw, broken teeth, and multiple lacerations. Due to the extent of the dog's injuries, the shelter reached out to the public asking for $3,000 in donations to cover the cost of Little Chevy surgeries. The public then responded by raising $7,730. The Delta County Shelter credits the community with saving Little Chevy, and they say the dog is expected to make a full recovery with the exception of having minor vision loss in one of her eyes. Currently, there is an ongoing expense, expansive court case in regards to holding opioid drug makers responsible for the nation's opioid crisis, and there is a new question being asked. Attorneys representing children and guardians are seeking to have claims of babies born addicted to drugs to be considered separately from the current case. The attorneys believe it as a different legal question from the current case and argued this in front of a front of a panel of judges in New York. From 2012 to 2016, more than 150,000 babies were born with opioid withdrawal, and the attorneys argued that the babies are being directly harmed by the actions of the drug makers. A ruling by the judges is expected in the next couple weeks. America's expected lifespans are declining, and one factor that is pushing this number down is in the increases to suicides and drug overdoses. 2017 was said to have been the most deaths in a single year since deaths have started to been recorded in the U.S., with more than 2.8 million deaths nationally. As the nation grows in population, this is a common occurrence, but the surprise has been that the increase in deaths of younger age groups, particularly middle-aged people, has gone up. The suicide rate is at the highest it has been in 50 years, with close to 50,000 suicides last year. With the last few decades increasing the life expectancy, the current decline is worrisome. After the break, we'll have your national and international news. Stay tuned. Fueled by creativity and passion, Michiganders are capable of doing anything they set their minds to. And on this upcoming episode of Destination Michigan, we're sharing the stories of some remarkable people who aren't afraid to put the time in and get their hands dirty to create something amazing. From the whimsical to the practical, they all have one thing in common. All of them are Michigan made. So come along with us for this very special episode of Destination Michigan. Tonight at 9 and Saturday at 7 p.m. Welcome back. The Chinese government has stopped the work by a medical team that has claimed to have helped make the world's first gene-edited babies. The babies behind the claim are two twin girls, reportedly born earlier this month, in which the team claims to have edited their genes to make them resistant to the AIDS virus. 
Other scientists have condemned the team's research, saying that gene editing in humans crosses a moral and ethical line. The Chinese Vice Minister of Science and Technology called the team's actions illegal and has ordered an investigation, but there has been no further talk of specific actions that have been taken. And leaders from the world's top 20 industrialized countries have begun get gathering in Buenos Aires for this year's G20 summit. They will discuss trade, climate, and other issues that both unite and divide them. President Trump and the First Lady left for Argentina this morning. Mola Lenghi has the latest from the White House. President Trump departed this morning for a summit in Argentina with world leaders. He's scheduled to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping amid the prospect of a full-blown trade war. I think China wants to make a deal. I'm open to making a deal. But frankly, I like the deal we have right now. The U.S. levied new tariffs on China this year in response to what it calls unfair trade practices. And additional tariffs could be coming. So what we have right now is billions and billions of dollars coming into the United States in the form of tariffs or taxes. With Russia still holding three Ukrainian naval vessels in a territorial dispute, President Trump will not be meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the summit. This morning, the president said it was possible, but he later tweeted, based on the fact that the ships and sailors have not been returned to Ukraine from Russia, I have decided it would be best for all parties concerned to cancel my previously scheduled meeting. The president headed to the summit one day after the Senate voted to advance legislation that would end U.S. military support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Lawmakers are pushing back against the president's defense of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. U.S. intelligence has concluded he at least knew about the plot to kill Washington Post contributor Jamal Khashoggi. The way the administration's handled the Saudi Arabia event is just not acceptable. The president has said he would meet with the Crown Prince in Buenos Aires, but there is nothing on the schedule. Mola Lenghi, CBS News, the White House. In October, Brazil held general elections that led to the election of Jair Bolsonaro, the current president-elect. Recently, Brazil has withdrawn its offer to host the U.N. Conference on Climate Change next year, and this is suspected to be due to Bolsonaro's campaign promises to pull out of the Paris Accords on Climate Change. The official reasoning from Brazil on their decision was due to current fiscal and budget constraints that were expected to stay around for the foreseeable future. The meeting has now been scheduled to happen in Poland in 2019. Facebook, or uh, Trump, President Trump took a, a new step yesterday in his response to the special counsel investigation, saying that pardoning his former campaign in an interview, the president said that he wouldn't rule out using the presidential power if charges result from the investigation into his campaign. Manafort has admitted to financial fraud and could spend the rest of his life in prison. Paula Reed at the White House with details. We have a lot of bad people. We have a lot of phony stuff, like the Russian witch hunt garbage. Special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation could be reaching its conclusion after 19 months, 35 indictments, and millions of taxpayer dollars spent. The witch hunt, as I call it, from what I hear, it's ending. Now the president is looking to deploy a new weapon, a pardon. In an interview with the New York Post, the president said a pardon for his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was never discussed, but I wouldn't take it off the table. Why would I take it off the table? I think the message is, listen, if you stay loyal, um, I will take care of you later. Former Whitewater prosecutor Kim Whaley says the public suggestion of a pardon could open the president up to further allegations of obstruction of justice. We want the facts and the law to carry the day and not pressure from someone who has greater power. That's the idea behind obstruction of justice. Manafort's attorney has been updating the president's legal team on what the special counsel wants to know. The president was armed with that information as he crafted his own written responses to the special counsel. They're all finished. The written answers are finished. CBS News has learned the president's written answers to special counsel's team said, to the best of his recollection, he did not know about WikiLeaks' plan to release hacked Democratic emails during the 2016 campaign. And he also didn't know about the 2016 Trump Tower meeting attended by Manafort, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and a Russian lawyer promising dirt on Hillary Clinton. The president used that phrase, to the best of my recollection. That's something that lawyers often advise their clients to use because it makes it much harder to prove that you intentionally lied or committed perjury. Paula Reed, CBS News, the White House. And after the break, we will have your weather and sports. Stay tuned.
Friday night at 9 on Public TV 13. And welcome back to Public Eye News Weather. I'm Am Diaz, your weather man for today. And behind me is a nice snowy NMU campus. And looking at our current conditions, it is currently 28 degrees and snow winds south at 7 miles an hour. Barometric pressure at 29.96 and falling. Looking at tonight, we are looking at some more snow below of 29 degrees winds south at 8 miles an hour. And looking at tomorrow, we are looking at partly cloudy, high of 36 winds west southwest at 6 miles an hour. Taking a look across our UP, it is mostly snowing, and inside Sault Ste. Marie, it is cloudy and 34 degrees. Manistique, 31, and Escanaba, 32, Menominee at 34. And moving over to the other side of the UP, we are looking at Iron Mountain, 27, Ironwood, 26, Hone, cloudy at a 27, and beautiful Marquette at 28 degrees. And looking ahead into our week, we're looking at Saturday, the high of 35, the low of 31, and cloudy. Sunday, the high of 34, the low of 27, and AM snow. Monday, high of 29, the low of 22, and cloudy. Hopefully the weather doesn't lock up here, and I hear you have something of a lock up of your own. Absolutely, thank you, Adam. Wendell Brown, an American citizen and former college football player who played for Ball State University, was arrested in 2016 for assault during a bar fight in China. Brown was in China teaching football and English when he was involved in a bar fight that would lead to an arrest and land him in prison after he denied that he hit a man and claimed he was defending himself. Brown appealed his sentence and was recently just given a reduced sentence. Brown is set to be free on September 24th, 2019. Fernando La Fuente, a 29-year-old soccer player in Dublin, Ireland, was falsely re reported dead by his former soccer club, Ballybrack, in order to get a game postponed. F Fernando said that he will not press charges against his former club that claimed Fernando died in a car crash and that they did not have a death certificate because they sent the body to a coffin or er, in a coffin to Spain. Fernando played with the soccer club last season, but moved to Galloway, Ireland, where he was, where he is a software engineer. The people responsible for the news of his death have been fired, and the team has apologized. The Washington Redskins say that there is no guarantee that linebacker Reuben Foster will ever suit up and play for them. Foster, who was arrested during Saturday night, was arrested Saturday night and charged with one count of first-degree misdemeanor domestic violence, was released from the 49ers Monday following his arrest. The Redskins then brought Foster on, but then they received backlash for bringing him in as soon as, the, as, soon as he was arrested. Foster has been arrested for domestic violence charge before, but those charges were later dropped. The second-year linebacker also received a two-game suspension at the beginning of his season following an arrest on a gun charge and a misdemeanor marijuana possession. The Redskins are still investigating Foster and his team with future, and it remains unclear. That's all the time we have for you today at Public Eye News. I want to thank you for coming in, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thank you. Studios, located in the Edgar L. Hardin Learning Resources Center by WNMU-TV, Northern Michigan University Public Television.